Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Johnson with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Thank you for joining us for a webinar on our report that was just released, Progress Toward Restoring the Everglades, the Eighth Biennial Review 2020. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at nap.edu. And a recording of this webinar will be available on our website in the coming weeks. For those of you not familiar with the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, we are nonprofit private institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the nation to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology and medicine. On the topic of Everglades restoration, this is the 16th Academy report since 1999 and this eighth biennial report under the congressional mandate from the Water Resources Development Act of 2000. For each study, committee members are chosen for their expertise and experience and they serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released. So before I turn this over to, to the committee chair, I want to go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with an overview presentation from four committee members summarizing the report, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question. And you can submit questions at any time during the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce the chair of the committee that wrote the report, Charlie Driscoll. Charlie is University and Distinguished Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Syracuse University. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, and good afternoon. And thank you all for, uh, for coming to this uh, webinar. Um, so as Stephanie said, we're gonna talk about the um, report uh, of the, um, Everglades Restoration Committee or CISRUP. Uh, so this report on average comes out uh, every two years and there is a statement of task associated with this which is carried through each of these reports. Um, so this is shown here. There are four elements of the report. The first and fourth, first and fourth elements are covered in each report, including an assessment of progress in restoring the natural system and an independent review of monitoring and assessment protocols to be used in the evaluation of CERP progress. The second and third elements vary depending on the report. And generally they address issues that are very timely concerning the overall restoration or problems that have come up and that would make sense for us to focus on. So these vary from, from report to report and include discussion of significant accomplishments in restoration, and discussion and evaluation of specific scientific and engineering issues that may impact the progress towards receipt, uh, reaching the restoration goals. So I have been very fortunate to work with a very talented committee. Uh, they're listed here and with their affiliations. And we have a number of them here that are gonna help out in this webinar, including to give uh, parts of the presentation as well as to address questions at the end of the session. So I'd like to just go through this in order and ask them to introduce themselves and, and indicate their institutions. And we'll start out with Casey. Hi everyone, I'm Casey Brown from the University of Massachusetts. Okay, next, Ehab. Hello everyone, I'm Ehab Misalhi with Tulane University. Thank you, Ehab. Next, Denise Reed. Hi, everybody. My name is Denise Reed. I'm a coastal geomorphologist, University of New Orleans. Okay, thank you. Next, Jim Sayers. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Sayers, a hydrologist at Yale University. Next, Martha. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Martha Satula, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Next, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeff Walters in the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. And last but certainly not least, Denise Waldrop. Hi, good afternoon, Denise Waldrop, a wetland ecologist in the Department of Geography at Penn State. Is there anybody else from the committee that may have come on that I missed? 
Okay. Uh, in addition to the committee members, we also have very capable staff from the National Academies. You heard Stephanie Johnson at the beginning of the presentation. Stephanie has been with the Everglades uh, Restoration through the Academies since 2002. She knows a lot about the Everglades, very capable, and uh, she was instrumental in terms of uh, completing this report. Okay, a little bit about the uh, study process. We started this activity in May of 2019. We had four in-person meetings. In addition to those meetings, we had a series of web conferences with various experts to seek information about things that we would consider and address in this report. In the in-person meetings, we heard from a number of individuals and we also received public comments. We got very valuable information that helped us uh, address the issues that we'll cover in this briefing. In addition to those presentations, one of my favorite activities is the field trips. We had five terrific field trips, which was really great to see the restoration in progress, talk with people who are working on that. And we got a lot of insight is through those field trips. So we're really grateful to the effort at uh, pulling off a good field trip. Then uh, we were faced with COVID. So we transitioned to virtual meetings. We had uh, a few additional uh, full committee meetings as well as subcommittee meetings focusing on individual, individual chapters to wrap up the report, which was done in the beginning of the summer 2020. The report then went out for peer review, as Stephanie said, we got the reviewer comments. By the end of the summer 2020, we uh, responded to those comments and revised the report. We were anticipating that we would give this and the other briefings and the release of the report in the fall, but there was a contractual gap that caused the delay. And so here we are in March and the report has been released and we're giving a series of briefings, including this webinar today. Okay, a little bit about SERP or the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, it's a very large restoration effort in South Florida. It was initiated in 2000, so it's been going on for a long time and it's projected to, to go a long time in the future. Uh, it's a state federal partnership with the tagline to get the water right. We have a cartoon here showing South Florida and to illustrate sort of the dimensions and complexity of the restoration effort. It includes more than 40 major projects and 68 project components. It really is doing a lot to move water around in South Florida, in some cases, minimizing flows of water to the coast, improving storage capacity that has lost been been lost through historical development to try to encourage water moving south and to treat that water so it's adequate quality to move into the protected area to provide barriers against seepage uh, along the eastern side to try to reestablish the uh, sheet flow that uh, has had gone on historically. In addition to water, there are a number of other elements associated with it, not the least of which is addressing uh, invasives within the region itself. As I said, it's a very complex, uh, long-standing uh, project and um, very, very interesting and important effort. So for this, uh, this report, uh, we have four major focal areas. Um, you know, I think this is really an important report. SIP, SERP is pivoting from planning and advancing individual projects to operations and management of a partially restored system. And in this regard, science and particularly system thinking is going to be very important to support decision making. So there are sort of four elements of the report, major elements of the report, and this is what we'll cover in this briefing. So the first is on restoration project and SERP has uh, several ongoing project and some of these are showing responses to increments. The next is the combined operational plan and that is gonna be handled by Jeff. COP is really big, it's a huge step for SERP and it shows with modified waters delivery to Everglades National Park and the C-111 South Dade projects, there'll be substantial deliveries of water south and both the projects and COP have provide a great opportunity for learning and adaptive management. Next, we are going to cover estuaries. And 
previous reports, the committee has touched on estuaries, but not provided much detail. So we wanted to do a deeper dive into estuaries and we did. There's a lot of interest in estuaries because of major projects that are being constructed as well as the releases of water from Lake Okeechobee and the adjacent watershed that are contributing to water quality problems in HABs. And Martha is gonna cover uh, some, some important elements of the estuary section. And the last section is gonna be covered by Casey. And this concerns science to support decision-making. And because of this pivot that I talked about, uh, it's really critical that for improved tools and the use of data, are available to support uh, the analysis for future projects and decision making. And this idea of science to support decision making is sort of a critical theme that is woven through the report. So let's get started. And as we start, I'd like to sort of orient you towards the ongoing projects. There are seven SERP ongoing projects and you can see them here in the map on the right. The first two shown on the map in four and eight are two very large reservoirs that are under construction. Uh, the C44 reservoir shown in four and the C43 reservoir along the Kalutahatchee River shown in eight. These are very impressive. We had the opportunity to visit uh, this and talk to folks uh, during one of our field, or during two of our field trips, excuse me. Next, Picayune Strand, which is shown down here in two. Picayune Strand is a site of considerable restoration progress, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Next, there are two elements of the Central Everglades Planning Project, new waters shown approximately here in 12 and south shown here at 11. Next, there's Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands, which is shown about in this area around the uh, symbol seven. And then finally, at this symbol where it says six, is the location of the C-111 Spreader Canal. So as I mentioned, we're starting to see progress. This is very exciting. Part of this has to do with the timing. There's been a lot of planning, design, building, and now we're starting to see things happening. And that's great news. The committee is very excited as the people are who have been working on this for a long time. An important element is significant increases in funding. Uh, for the first time, state and federal funds have exceeded $200 million from both sources. And this is, this is big. This level of funding what was, is the level that was envisioned uh, when the Yellow Book was first developed at the start of SERP. So it's quite exciting to see this level of support. And with increases in funding, SERP projects can be completed more quickly, resulting in faster restoration and increasing the mitigation of the degraded system. And so it's important to point out that even though progress is, is being made, uh, the system is highly degraded and is susceptible to further degradation. Um, so time is of the essence and it's good that uh, the progress is, is happening. An important component of this report uh, addressed issues concerning the Integrated Delivery Schedule or IDS. The IDS shows project sequencing and budgeting as an important communication tool. IDS can be used to demonstrate the effects of increased or decreased funding on SERP implementation. The 2000, 2019 IDS presented the fastest possible construction schedule by assuming optimistic budget projections. It might be assumed that if with if less funding is available, then the project sequences would remain the same, but just be delayed. But this is a false or a poor assumption. It's important to realize that ecosystem degradation is time dependent. And given this situation, the priority of projects may shift depending on the funding available and the time required to complete them. Okay, as I mentioned, there are signs of significant restoration project, progress, excuse me, from three SERP projects. Uh, Picayune Strand, which is shown in this photo sequence here on the right. This uh, upper panel shows the before and the lower panel shows the after of restoration, which is, which is great to see. In addition to Picayune Strand, there are also increments at the C111 Spreader Canal in the Biscayne Bay coastal wetlands. 
the limitations in monitoring, analysis, and communication of results of Hamburg quantitative assessment and communication of restoration benefits. Monitoring in the areas that are operational, such as the increments in Picayune Strand and Biscayne Bay coastal wetlands, have provided qualitative restoration progress. Uh, however, the assessments are of restoration progress have been stymied by a lack of systematic analysis of quantitative results from early indicators of restoration relative to expected outcomes. As a result, important opportunities for learning and improved management are being missed both at the project and system scale. So before I hand this over to Jeff, I wanna talk about two additional areas that were emphasized in the report. The first is the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project and uh, delayed implementation of the major features of this project will help accommodate numerous uncertainties associated with an important technology Aquifer Storage and Recovery, or ASR. This technology remains unproven at the propo proposed scale of deployment. To address critical unknowns while moving forward with restoration, installation should proceed in increments of two to five ASR wells with post-monitoring, post-installation monitoring conducted to address questions that concerning the quality of recharged and recovered waters, ecological effects, and recovery efficiencies. The other area I wanted to touch on was actually an area that I worked on in the report, and that concerns stormwater treatment areas. So stormwater treatment areas are large constructed wetlands that have been used to remove phosphorus inputs uh, to, the, uh, to the Everglades protection area. However, um, STAs have not proven capable yet of achieving the water quality, water quality conditions that are necessary to send waters to the Everglades protection areas. Efforts are underway by the South Florida Water Management District to analyze and optimize STA performance and hopefully then avoid delays in meeting the water quality criteria and delivering the new water to the central Everglades. The other item that is exciting is to you look into the potential for STAs to remove nitrogen. Primarily STAs have been used to reduce phosphorus, but as we will learn from Martha on the estuaries, there's also a lot of concern about nitrogen. And so research is being conducted by the South Florida Water Management District to improve understanding in nitrogen retention and loss in STAs. And if there could be enhanced nitrogen removal, this could prove to be an approach to mitigate nutrient releases uh, to estuaries and mitigate harmful algal blooms. So with that, I would like to turn the program over to Jeff Walter, and he's going to talk to us about COP. Thank you, Charlie. So the COP is a new water management plan for the Central Everglades, governing operations for water flowing through the water conservation areas into Everglades National Park and onto Florida Bay. Uh, it replaces the ERTP, the Everglades Restoration Plan, and employs for the first time infrastructure from the recently completed pre-SERP, modified water deliveries, and C111 South Dade projects. The COP epitomizes the pivot from restoration planning to implementation that's a central theme of our report, as it employs new infrastructure to create significant changes in hydrology compared to what preceded at ERTP that are anticipated to produce significant changes to ecology. Many of these changes represent restoration benefits. For example, although no new water is added to the system under COP, the COP will greatly alter the distribution of flows of existing water. It promises to restore the historical distribution of water in Shark River Slough, for example, such that two thirds of the water will flow through Northeast Shark River Slough to the east and one third through Western Shark River Slough to the West. Since the 1970s, the flow has been reversed with only a third going through the East and two thirds through the West, resulting in overly wet conditions in the West and overly dry conditions in the East at times, causing a myriad of undesirable ecological changes and many restoration goals for SERP involve reversing these changes. It's been an objective to redistribute flow in Shark River Slough since the 1980s. So restoring it under COP is a big deal. COP will result in a variety of other significant changes as well, such as increasing flows to Florida Bay. In that case, we're talking about a small increment toward the ultimate objective, not the full Monty, like 
COP is promising for redistributing flows in Shark River Slough. Now, one point that we wanted to make um, was that it's going to be important to, to communicate the benefits of, of COP to a public that's eager to see returns on all the investments in restoration. Toward that end, we recommend that changes that constitute restoration benefits and restoration success be measured against the ERTP. During the process for selecting the preferred alternative for COP, many benefits of COP were quantified, but relative to the no action alternative baseline, which was not ERTP. And that's because in the development of COP, managers tested the capabilities of the new infrastructure, resulting in significant change to water management and operation at the conclusion of these field tests was used as the COP baseline. So there are actually two increments to the benefits of COP, first from ERTP to baseline, and then second from this baseline to the full COP. So using that baseline was fine for the purposes of developing the COP, but we suggest that when measuring restoration success under COP, measure changes relative to ERTP, not to the COP baseline. Next slide, Charlie. We found the process for arriving at the final COP to be systematic and comprehensive, but we did have some suggestions for improvements that could be applied to future planning efforts. <laughs> The analyses in picking the final COP compared abilities of various alternatives to meet planning objectives, which were mostly ecological restoration benefits, but incorporated other things like constraints, especially maximum flood risk in two particular areas, concerns, which were things like water supply and recreation, and planning considerations, which included things like in opportunities for enhanced flood mitigation and compatibility of the COP with SEP, the next big project coming to the central Everglades. It's not clear how trade-offs between these different things were handled. For example, did selection of the preferred alternative involve sacrificing some planning objective benefits to achieve more flood mitigation or more water supply benefits? It's not clear that we think the trade-offs that are made and the rationale involved in them should be transparent in these kind of planning efforts. Also, there needs to be more information about model uncertainty. As the COP is implemented, it would be critical to determine whether what is happening on the ground matches model projections. We need to know what range of outcomes fall within the bounds of model uncertainty to do that and, and which ones do not, because if they don't, that indicates a need to improve the models to incorporate new understanding of hydrology and ecology that emerges as the system responds to restoration actions. Also, the expected performance of COP is evaluated based was, was evaluated based on historical conditions, basically how COP would have performed in the past. It would be useful in these planning efforts to evaluate how projected, uh, how a plan is projected to perform over a range of possible future conditions, given that we know that with climate change and sea level rise, we cannot any longer count on the past being prologue for the future. It appeared to the committee that flood risk for the 8.5 square mile area was the biggest obstacle to restoring historical distribution of flows in Shark River Slough, as it has been in previous attempts to redistribute these flows. And there have indeed been problems with flooding in the 8.5 square mile area since the report was written. The committee was encouraged to learn recently that plans are already underway to, to uh, address this problem so that it doesn't prevent COP from achieving its restoration goals. Next slide. The COP also epi epitomizes new opportunities for learning resulting from the pivot from project planning to implementation and to use new knowledge to manage adaptively. There's a lot of potential for adaptive management within the COP and there's a detailed adaptive management plan for the COP that will enable managers to learn from system responses to operations and use that information to make adjustments to the COP. But the committee is even more excited about opportunities for system-wide adaptive management provided by the COP. The implications of differences between expected and observed hydrology and ecology go far beyond the operations of COP. COP provides an opportunity to test many of the hydrological, ecological, and conceptual models that have been used in planning the Everglades restoration. And the resulting improvements could be relevant to many CERT projects, enabling adjustments and improvements through the adaptive management process. For example, the COP tackles one of the other biggest challenges along with the 8.5 square mile area for restoration efforts, and that's integrating recovery of the endangered Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow with restoration. The COP is projected to impact the sparrow significantly, producing new habitat in some areas and resulting in loss of existing habitat 
in some places where sparrow, sparrows currently live. Much will be learned about sparrows from the, what happens under the cop. For example, does the redistribution of flows in Shark River Slough produce the kinds of changes in vegetation and thus redistribution of suitable habitat for sparrows expected? If there is new habitat, do the sparrows move into it? Do they colonize it? If they won't go there on their own, can we move them in there and will they stay there if we do that? Does nesting success improve in areas that it's projected to improve in and therefore those populations increase? What is learned about the sparrow from COP will be invaluable to planning and implementing CERP projects, notably the SEP. The sparrow case is just one of a multitude of examples for system-wide adaptive management resulting from what is learned as the COP gets under, underway and under operation. But the ability to benefit from opportunities for adaptive management depends on having adequate staff. The pivot from planning and modeling to implementation analysis of system responses requires having the right staff to accomplish the latter. There will be increased demand for scientific support right away with the COP to comp compile, analyze, synthesize um, all the monitoring data coming in, evaluate restoration success, and get the right information to decision makers to enable system-wide adaptive management. And with that, I'll hand off to Martha Satula, who will talk to us about estuaries. Next slide. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> So as most of you know, SWP was actually designed um, originally to really help with uh, help address the issues with water inflows to all the estuaries, understanding that this would um, be only part of the solution to the challenges that are facing these important habitats. Uh, SERP ecological restoration goals um, cannot be met though without addressing uh, some of the major environmental issues that these estuaries are facing. A good example is for the northern estuaries in Biscayne Bay and their issues with water quality and algal blooms. Uh, if water quality impacts and other environmental issues are not well understood, um, our concern is that CERT may be unfairly blamed for failing to meet um, the expected outcomes of, um, of this uh, restoration program. Next slide. So the committee wanted to take on um, uh, providing uh, recommendations um, you know, and thinking a little bit more deeply about this issue. And the first thing that we found was that um, you have existing data and tools now that are underutilized to inform um, estuary restoration. For example, in the Northern estuaries, um, you have watershed loading and water quality model, uh, modeling capabilities uh, now that can be used to um, begin, the, begin to understand the linkages between hydrological restoration and the quantities of flows, um, it, their inherent water quality, and how that results in algal blooms. In the southern estuaries, and particularly in Florida Bay, you have a much improved understanding and tools that can be used to revisit and clarify CERT goals um, in terms of um, what can actually be achieved. So we think that strategic use of the science now can actually help to point to the critical data gaps and modeling needs um, that will really help to clarify the key investments in monitoring and model development for the future to give, to give you the toolkit that you need to really inform how, how the restoration program goes forward. Um, but we did actually spend a fair amount of time evaluating um, available monitoring data and your models and we made some specific suggestions that could be considered um, with respect to um, what is needed to examine alternatives and, and look at the trade-offs between water quantity, water quality, and the biological outcomes in these estuaries. So for example, we, we called out the need for spatially explicit water quality modeling and a sustained program of monitoring and research that could help to build um, towards a predictive harmful algal bloom model, modeling toolkit for the Northern estuaries, understanding that this is a critical issue of importance um, for those communities. Uh, in Biscayne Bay, um, watershed loading models and water quality models are needed to link restoration and other human activities um, that are happening in that landscape and link them to the salinity, water quality, and light limitations um, that um, appear to be impacting the viability of seagrass in, in Biscayne Bay. Um, mechanistic, um, furthermore, mechanistic biological models are needed um, in the northern estuaries that can capture the quantitative basis between freshwater flows, water quality drivers, and biological goals um, for uh, those prized uh, um, habitats of seagrass and oysters. Um, predictive tools are needed to identify thresholds and tipping points 
in all the estuaries and, and um, absolutely for Florida Bay to help you really understand and, um, and disentangle those complex factors that are associated with salinity, algal blooms, and seagrass die off. Um, and then finally, as an example, a Southern Everglades transition zone monitoring and modeling program is needed that really supports project planning and can help to uh, couple um, your existing regional hydrological models, um, including both groundwater and surface water exchanges with essentially what's happening in the estuaries on the receiving water end with respect to estuarine hydrodynamics, salinity, water quality, and biological outcomes. So having clarity, um, first of all, in the future water management decisions that need to be made can really help to prioritize this research and the, what monitoring data you need, what models need to be further developed and how they can be used in tandem to create a synthesis that can guide um, your future actions. Next slide. So as you improve and increase the mechanistic basis for this, for this modeling toolkit, we think that um, the, the investment is really gonna pay off for you in terms of helping to support discussions of climate change adaptation, which is a grand challenge um, for the Florida landscape. So for example, um, uh, modeling of coastal boundaries to understand the effects of sea level rise and how that impacts estrogen hydrodynamics, the salinity regimes and the ecosystem feedbacks, biogeochemical and biological is critically important to really go further with mechanistic investigations to understand how those you know, primary drivers, climate and sea level rise and their effects on temperature and flow and salinity are, are really um, causing a, a set of uh, feedbacks on HABs, on seagrass or on peak collapse, for example. And then having the, these ultimately investing and making them mech mechanistic, we think that's really a, an important component of this because it's gonna increase your confidence and the ability to use those tools to be able to um, plan out scenarios of uh, potential water management responses um, that are, I think are really key for planning and adaptive management of these uh, um, estuaries uh, going into the future. So with that, I will stop and, and pass it back to Casey. Great, uh, thanks Martha. So um, the previous chapters addressed uh, timely specific topics. Um, chapter six really addresses a common theme that emerged from our uh, various conversations, many conversations that we had with stakeholders and, and staff uh, through the last um, assessment period. And um, I think the, the theme that emerged is this question of how science supports decision-making and a, a reaction to chapter six might be something along the lines of, well, we use science all the time. Um, science is used, we use models, we collect data, we talk to experts and all those things are true. Um, so I want to just begin uh, this discussion of chapter six with a, a short personal reflection on how it really came about. And, and maybe most importantly, to begin with a definition of science and the definition I'll use comes from Richard Feynman, as I paraphrase him, he's a Nobel uh, laureate physicist, and the definition is, science is the practice of proving the experts wrong. So science is the practice of proving the experts wrong. And let's dig into that a little bit. First, the most important probably is that science is a practice. It's not a model, uh, it's not a data set, it is a practice or, or a process. The second point relates to the ignorance of experts. And while everyone loves a good laugh at uh, experts being proven wrong, I realize that in science, the expert most likely to be proven wrong is yourself, the one conducting the experiment. And the corollary to that is if you're doing something and you can't prove yourself wrong, then it's not really science. At its best, science is a formalized process of developing and testing hypotheses learning from those tests to improve the hypotheses. So what does this have to do with SERP? Well, really we can think of SERP as a $23 billion hypothesis that a set of investments is going to restore the Florida Everglades and, and provide a host of services for the people of South Florida. And this is a hypothesis that was developed under a great deal of uncertainty. And so it needs science. And so now let's uh, turn to chapter six, uh, which is really um, tries to address this topic. 
And the first point is that, as, as others have mentioned already, that there is a great opportunity to begin to test this hypothesis that restoration is going to work as some of the projects are coming online. And Charlie, you can uh, go to the first bullet. Thank you, yep. Um, and as we test this hypothesis, we'll learn uh, from the projects coming online and then we can adjust and improve decisions or improve our hypothesis as we learn. And the second key point is that because science is so important and, it, and there's this great opportunity from learning from projects as they come online that we can uh, or we really should think carefully about how we design our monitoring and our monitoring and how we can synthesize both in order to get the best possible learning from the ongoing activities and, and use them to, again, to improve our hypotheses about our next steps. You can go to the next slide, Charlie. There we go. Here's that last bullet. Yeah, next slide. So here's some um, specific ideas about uh, uh, steps that can be taken for linking science to decisions. And the first is thinking about uh, monitoring. And specifically, of course, there's a great and a very impressive monitoring effort going on. Um, but a question that arises is, are we benefiting uh, and realizing the potential of the, all the monitoring um, that is taking place to the extent that we could? And realizing that potential really requires revisiting the strategy uh, and the design for monitoring to make sure we're answering these fundamental questions about SERP as projects come online, which is, is it really working? The next important theme relates to the, the use of models. And the modeling efforts uh, of SERP is absolutely impressive. Uh, the work of the Interagency Modeling Center is, is outstanding and, the, and that was on full display in, during COP uh, as, as was reviewed earlier. Um, the question here really is, Again, um, can this use of models uh, benefit restoration even more? We see two potential areas for that to take place. The first is the assessment of restoration progress, and that's the assimilation of data and models to give us a better understanding of the, the status of the system right now. Um, and the second area is the evaluation of future scenarios. So the model that the model effort so far has been primarily focused on getting projects, evaluating projects and getting projects uh, approved. And that's important. But the question here is, um, given that there's a change in baseline, could these models also be used to help us anticipate the future and adjust as necessary? And then the uh, additional area that we identified related to synthesis. So the next bullet, thanks Charlie. And we really see synthesis as being the engine of science. It's bringing together the, the data, it's bringing together the, the learning from the models and, and integrating them in a way that we're learning about the system as a whole. And again, it's essential as these projects are beginning to come online. And really a, a key basis for synthesis is good data management practices. There's a, a, a large, uh, really, a an impressive effort in terms of data collection. Um, but again, we can't fully benef benefit from all that data until there's, or, or we can benefit more with great data management practices that includes metadata and other good uh, common practices to allow us to compare data sets across different uh, fields and different uh, methods for collection. Next slide. I wanted to spend just a second on a topic that I think has great potential uh, for SERP, and that is data assimilation. And this is a practice that is commonly used, especially in weather forecasting, to integrate in an optimal way observations and models to create the best possible estimate you can get from both. And it's really ideally suited for a situation such as SERP, where we have lots of different kinds of data collected. We have models that uh, provide a comprehensive look at the system, and we can bring those together to create something called a nowcast, which has the potential to provide us probably the best estimate of current conditions and, and could be a powerful tool for uh, for really evaluating status and how the system is evolving as a whole. This would require new effort uh, for certain um, and, and new modeling approaches, 
But I do think it's something that's worth considering given the potential that it has to, to benefit the system and the restoration. Uh, next slide. And yes, uh, so these are um, really summarized in a final, or, or these points um, are really can't happen until we think also about the organization of the, the people who are going to really do this synthesis. And so uh, the final point we wanted to make was regarding the need for a nimble organizational structure for science. And this includes a number of things shown on the next bullets that there's adequate staffing of appropriately trained staff uh, and scientists, that there's a continuity of expertise throughout the life cycle of projects. And so this is something that was clear through COP really benefited from a, a team of people working together over a great period of time. And I should also mention that COP uh, was really a, a process that illustrated learning from natural experiments that were taking place to inform some of the options that were evaluated. And strong science leadership is essential and strong science leadership really part of that is realizing that science is not a, a peripheral or, or an add-on to CERT, but it's an essential engine of restoration. It's how we learn whether restoration is working or not and how we can adjust our hypotheses and to make sure that it will work given the, the changing landscape. I just have one more slide, a figure I wanted to share. And this is a, a, a chart of, of funding for recover over time. And this is a, pro you can think of this as a proxy really for funding for synthesis, for science and synthesis. And you can see that the funding has tailed off while the challenge or the, the, the need for science and synthesis is only growing. And that's especially true, as I mentioned, going forward, given that the projects are coming on uh, line right now. And so there's a great opportunity for learning uh, and, and really testing and improving our hypotheses about restoration. Over to you, Charlie. Okay, thank you, Casey. And thank you to my colleagues for those, uh, those overviews of the section of the report. So I'd just like to summarize, and then I'd like to transition to uh, question and answers. So we've seen an expedited pace of restoration uh, implementation, which has been supported by recent funding levels. Indeed, good news. We also are very excited about the COP implementation will, is expected to deliver substantial benefits. And with this, uh, there is great opportunities to learn and enhance these benefits. Uh, we've learned that the estuaries are impacted by a variety of factors, a variety of disturbances, and SERP will certainly help, but is by no means the entire solution to improving the conditions of estuaries. Um, and indeed, water quality may limit achieving SERP goals. So given this, uh, the application of advanced science and modeling tools will help in this regard and try to maximize the impact of SERP to improve the condition of estuaries. And then finally, as SERP pivots from project planning and construction to operations and adaptive management, uh, strong science is absolutely critical to support decision-making. And this would include effective monitoring data analysis, synthesis, application of modeling tools, and strong scientific leadership with appropriate staffing. So as we said earlier, the report is available online. Uh, in addition, there are some resources that are available, including a press release and a four page uh, sort of crib notes of the report, uh, report in brief. And then the final report will be, uh, will be published this summer. So we thank you for your attention. And then I think my colleagues and I will be happy to take on questions if you have any. Thank you, Charlie, and thanks to our other committee presenters. Um, we have a few questions and please keep sending those in. Um, the first question is on estuaries. So either Martha or Denise Wardrop can take this. It's from Chris Robbins from the Ocean Conservancy. And the question is regarding HABs. Um, the report is saying that we need better predictive tools that predict conditions that could lead to HABs and to make better use of the data already collected and available. So what are the types of conditions or drivers and associated data sets that should be part of these predictive HAB models? 
Martha, I think that's something you've thought long and hard about in California. <laughs> so um, that's a great question, Chris. And I, and I think in the report, we dug into a little bit um, of a, a simple explanation of, of the typical HAB drivers that seem to have a com commonality across the landscapes. Um, you know, uh, whether that's Florida or other places. But I think that what's important to understand is that um, what is specifically driving HABs from location to location really depends. And so what we're recommending is, is a careful walk towards discerning what are the most important drivers um, for HABs through a process of ex using existing uh, tools and data targeting, um, uh, in, and that's gonna tell you a lot. I think a really great use of models is to tell you um, what you don't know and what's missing in terms of key data gaps. And then an incremental addition of observations and, um, and improved tools that inform your understanding over time. And so great examples, um, you know, I think some of the basic drivers that we understand um, um, always, to always seem to have some degree of influence include nutrients, flow, temperature. Um, there are a number of site-specific factors and so I could go on. And so I think, um, I think the message to you is that um, there's a basic set that seem to appear in most, um, most common water quality models and then um, uh, many others that represent site-specific conditions. Thanks, Martha. Um, the next question is likely for Casey. Um, does the report provide references of good examples of data assimilation procedures for using recent data to update model predictions? Um, and Jed says, Jed's from the Park Service, that this is a um, very useful concept and would like to start focusing on using these procedures. Um, yeah, that's great to hear. The report provides, I would say, an overview um, and um, some links to get started, some examples, uh, specific examples of how data assimilation is used. Um, there's a pretty rich literature on it, um, and it's, I'm, I'm happy to uh, gather information and, and provide more regarding specific questions. I would say the report provides an overview, a place to get started. Um, okay, the next question is from David Wegner. Um, and this might be a question for Denise Reed or Denise Wardrop about adaptive management and governance. And so as you pivot to operations and management and adaptive management of the SERP, is, are the proper governance and policies in place to support robust adaptive management programs that are necessary to carry the program. And, and maybe that taps into COP as well. If Jeff wants to, I will say that that's not something specifically we addressed in this report regarding the overall program. I can, uh, I can take a, a shot at that um, to some extent. I think uh, we have actually addressed this in previous reports in some way, um, but I think the part of this report that, that addresses this is this idea of, in chapter six, as Casey described, of really linking the science side with the decision making better. And I, and I think what, what we found overall was that there was a lot of good science going on, but we're asking questions about whether or not it was really at this point in where the program is delivering decision makers what they really need. And so that, of course, is inherent in, in adaptive management in terms of some kind of decision being made, whether it's an operational decision, whether it's a decision about uh, planning or, or a future project or something like that, and how those kind of feedback uh, mechanisms work has not to date from project data really been um, really been conducted on any scale at SERP, certainly not on the kind of scale that, that I think um, you know this, this was laid out um, originally uh, in, the, in the yellow book. And so it's really part of this pivot of now you've got projects on the ground. Now you are operating the system differently. Now you can collect information, which is which you can then use 
um, and in your models, with your models, as Casey just described, to really support the decisions that are coming up. And so I don't know if we're saying that the mechanisms are absent entirely, but they haven't yet been tested in the way that they are going to be tested. And so what we're, what we're suggesting in that, in that chapter six is that this is, a real, this is a really good time to make those connections and to make sure that adaptive management can work and that we can have those feedbacks between the, the generation, uh, you know, science data, modeling and those kinds of things and the decisions on how to move SERP forward. So maybe that, that this is a little indirect, Stephanie, but, but I think it's just about where the program is at the moment. I'd like to also add to that. I, I think Denise spoke, um, Denise number one spoke really eloquently to the um, project scale of that. And I'd also, you know, it's a great opportunity right now and really the first opportunity to do adaptive management at a system scale. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with um, COP and the IDS and just Casey's um, depiction on the slide of, of the support and funding for that large scale system wide view that somebody's looking at how the pieces are operating together because there is going to be a time when trade offs are going to start to become important and apparent. And there has to be a little bit more of a formal recognition of, of the need to be doing that adaptive management at the system-wide scale and looking at things at a system-wide scale. So I think at both scales, um, that needs to happen. And again, it's not that the tools aren't there, it's just that the muscles haven't quite been exercised yet. Stephanie, can I add, add one uh, observation and, and uh, you, you may clarify here. Um, the, on the diagram that, that Casey showed um, about the, the, the workload for, for Recover and, and that the science team for the Everglades is the, is the work on interim goals and interim targets that I believe has been initiated. The timing on that, I'm not quite sure what its status is now as of March 2021, but the timing on that work was not in a position where the committee could really uh, review it and weigh in on it, but clearly this, uh, this idea that in 2021, we are revisiting our interim goals and, and interim targets, which we haven't done for a long time, using new information. That's a really good opportunity to kind of do adaptive management. And in, in previous um, reports, we've talked to um, how to do it programmatically um, in terms of things like um, SOAP updates and, and those kinds of things, which there may also now be some, some, some movement on. So there are all kinds of different scales at which this as, as uh, Denise just described it, which this adaptive management um, works. And, you know, the exciting thing is that you're now at the position where it's all coming together. I'd like to add a little something about the COP. The committee did do some assessment of the relationship of science to decision making in the COP chapter with specifically about the COP adaptive management plan. Um, so there's some, you can see some examples of what the committee has been talking about there. Um, and maybe one theme from that is that where, because a lot of things are well specified and how the information is going to flow, where it's going to go and it is well specified, but tends to be a little bit less clear right at the top where you're at the level of where some decision might be made, where the, the science is at, at that last stage. All right, keep sending your questions in because we have about five more minutes left. I have a question that I'm going to assign to myself, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is why was there a four month contract gap? And that comes down to the fact that we have biennial reports, but we have uh, five year contracts. So it's kind of off cycle. And we had actually been expediting our processes. So we almost did three full cycles within a five year get um, contract but it just so happened that the timing of the report release was about a month when the contract end and there were glitches in the agency the sponsor side of getting the interagency agreement through headquarters so um, there was that delay in the process um, I, I did want to ask the question about to the whole committee about what you most want 
the Everglades restoration advocates and researchers to take away from the report. And so you guys might have different perspectives on this, but a chance to kind of sum up what you hope people will take away. And anyone can jump in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that 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 you know the that this is exciting because I've only been on two of these previous reports, but this idea of this pivot, this central theme in here, that now it's not about planning what you're gonna do, it's about planning what you're gonna do in the future at the same time that you are operating uh, and managing a partially restored system, that that is really exciting for the folks on the ground in the Everglades. It's really exciting for the committee to see. And it's a big challenge. And, and I think that that's kind of, for me anyway, the essence of, um, of, chapter, of chapter six. And, and if you look elsewhere in the, in, the, um, in the report, I think you'll see us mention that, that many of the foundational pieces for doing that are there. Um, and it's how they all come together that is, is gonna be the challenge uh, to, to make this, this next step work. But I think that this is an exciting time for the Everglades is, is one of the messages I would like to people to get from this report. I would second that without having to add much more. I think that was perfectly stated. I'm super excited, you know, especially since I did my dissertation 20 years ago plus in the Everglades, just to see how far that science has come. And um, what you have um, as tremendous assets to be able to move this program forward. I'm very excited to see it. All right, I'm gonna ask one last question before we wrap up a question from Dave Wegner, um, asking about whether the impacts of climate change and sea level rise will cause system changes so large that the models are no longer accurate in identifying system dynamics. And so I'll let you think about that for a while because that could go to Casey or Denise Reed or Jim. Um, and maybe the broader question is how does one adapt the models to better understand what might happen in climate change? I, I, I would say, and I think Martha hit it on the spot when she was she was talking about the estuaries chapter, that we need process-based models, right? And you know, if we've got process-based models that we're not relying on on historical statistical relationships, you know, that's that's the way to go. Uh, when we start getting outside of, of historical relationships, if we're basing just on, on statistics, for instance, then, um, then we could be in trouble. But you know, we understand a lot about those processes. Um, and so if we can build that into the modeling, and I think that's exactly what chapter five um, recommends, then that should help. It's a challenge for all of us who work on coastal systems though. I, I would agree as again, second, Denise, um, what you had to say, and, and I would just emphasize because we're facing the same issues on the West Coast, is that in order to not have um, your models, your management models become obsolete, there needs to be sustained investments over time so that climate change and other things don't catch you unawares. Um, and that's it, I think that's really important. I'll just add briefly that I think it's a great question. Um, there are a lot of models, lots of different kinds of models, and they'll be affected differently from by these changing um, baseline conditions. And I think that um, building on what Martha said, that evaluation of models has to be a continuous process, and that can only be done by comparing their predictions with the reality. And, and I think that needs to be done, not just in the context of sea level rise, um, but in, in general, with a changing baseline, a better understanding that models will drift if you don't compare them to reality, learn from the differences and correct them. Um, data simulation is a, is a way, but not the only way to do that. I would just add on, on top of that, the, the, uh, to me, the models of seagrass of die off are a perfect example of the success of science. I mean, there, that's, an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge about how that happens and that the building blocks now to really understand um, tipping points and predictive uh, capability has, is, is just there. And uh, it's a success story, really. Jim, you had a comment? 
I, yeah, this might uh, dovetail a little bit off of what Casey said. Um, in terms of hydrologic models, um, it's not uh, necessarily the case that hydrologic models that we use now won't be useful in the future. Um, but one of the things that we do have to do is, is run these models to account for forcing factors and different boundary conditions associated with different futures. So instead of using historical records to um, uh, predict hydrologic responses to changes in infrastructure, we have to account for future climate change, how rainfall will change in the future, um, how evapotranspiration will. Um, and uh, also with respect to hydrologic models, uh, Dave, you've mentioned sea level rise. And where that comes into models of the freshwater system is how it affects the boundary conditions and flows to the sea. And so we can use these current models, but we have to update them um, to account for sort of new forcing factors or modifications in forcing factors and boundary conditions. Great. Um, so thanks to everyone for this discussion. It looks like we're kind of at the end of our hour here. And, and um, so those are all the questions we have time for today. I wanted to say that once you exit the webinar, you're going to be redirected to our report page where you can download a free PDF of the report. And we hope that you'll continue to follow our process, which will kick off with its ninth biennial review. Um, and with a report expected in November 2022. So with that, I want to thank all our speakers from the committee and thank you for participating. Have a great afternoon.